What's going on, everybody? This is the Uncanny Omar, and today I have the pleasure of talking to this gentleman here to my right named Matt Hawkins. How are you, sir? Hey, everybody. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, Matt is, you are the, is it COO, president of Top Cow Comics? That's that correct. correct. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. And But you're also very diverse in the comics field. For a guy... Um, like, let's give a little bit of your background, which I think between the both of us, you're probably a little better than I am at giving a little more of your background. But you, but correct me if I'm wrong, you started in you started in comics. I remember your name popping up uh, during the extreme days of Image Comics. Yes, I was. Uh, I started in April of 1993 with Rob Liefeld, who hired me uh, on on the fly on the spine at a signing. Um, you'd have to ask him why he did. He said I had spunk. That's the reason he gave me years later. But uh, then worked at Extreme for five, six years until Extreme closed down. I was part of Awesome Comics with uh, with Jeff Loeb and Alan Moore and all those guys. And we did that book, those books uh, in 96, I think that was. That lasted for a year. Um, that was Rob Liefeld's company called Awesome Comics. We did Youngblood, Coven. You know, there were a bunch of really good books. But Alan Moore wrote Supreme. It was it was amazing. We did Judgment Day. You know, it's uh, it's interesting to be the editor for some of those legends when you're so young kind of weird but um and then uh in 97 i did lady pendragon three image central on my own with john stensman and then in 98 top cow hired me in april of 98 and i've been uh, at top cow since then so what is that 20 23 24 you're going on 24 years my goodness okay i gotta ask because there's a lot of people trying to break into the industry there's a lot of people that are trying to break into the industry for 30 20 years you were at a signing and you just walked up to Rob Liefeld. How did that happen? Um, I, you know, people, we call that our origins. We talk about how we got into comics and mine tends to piss people off because I did not read comics as a kid. I was not a huge lifelong fan. Um, I was in college studying my physics degree uh, when uh, I, my nephew asked if I would take him to a comic book store signing. And I did. And I was working full time. I was uh, going to school full time. I was in the lab for 30 hours. I lived in a fraternity house. I was very busy. Um, and uh, but I took my nephew to the signing. And uh, the job I worked at, I hated. I was doing retail banking, which is, is one of the most god awful jobs in the world dealing with the public. You know, I like dealing with conventions and comic public because they're fans and some of them can be odd or, you know, abrasive. But for the most part, people are pretty cool and chill. Um, but, uh, so I started working, like I said, top cow in, in 98 and been there for the entire time. Uh, but Rob, when I went up to, um, I'm sorry, I did, I need to finish the Rob story. So I, I was signing and, uh, it was a mile high comics opening in Anaheim, California and took my nephew and I didn't realize that we needed to get there. I didn't know who Rob Liefeld or Todd McFarlane or Jim Lee or Mark Smith. I didn't know who any of these people were, you know, I, I had not read comics. I didn't know who Deadpool was. Um, and uh, so I got there and waited in this long line with my nephew to get his book signed. And uh, the it was a really weird confluence of events because two of the guys right in front of me are artists that are still DC anchors, John Sabal and Marlo Alquiza. Oh, yeah. yeah. Standing in the line right in front of me to meet Rob also. And uh, so I spent two and a half hours in this line talking to these couple guys who wanted to meet Rob Liefeld. They explained to me who he was, why we were there, et cetera, okay. et cetera. So I get up to the front of the line and it's inside of this tent. They had this tent out in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I walk into the tent and there's Rob and about seven or eight other guys, Rob Michaels, Norm Ratman, Danny Mickey, uh, Richard Ory, Dan Frega, I don't remember, Eric Stevenson. Uh, oh, those wow. are the main people over there. And uh, they were all wearing, they all looked young. There were some cute girls there. They were all wearing these black leather Extreme Studios jackets. And uh, they look like little rock stars to me, man. And I, I, you know, doing retail banking sucks. And I, I was there at the signing with my nephew in my suit because I had to go back to work. And uh, so I, uh, yeah, I, I waited in this long line. Um, Rob was the first guy in. The, so you, you, when you get up to the tables, Rob was the first guy. Okay. It's weird. Now, now he'd be the last guy. You know what I mean? Normally, but for whatever mm -hmm. reason, I remember Rob was the first guy you came in. He was the first guy you saw. Um, and uh, so John Sabal and Marlo Akiza showed Rob their work right in front of me. And Rob hired uh, John on the spot. He said, you're hired. I love your work. And uh, that was one of those weird things where I just saw these young, good looking people having a great time. Uh, 
I hated the job I was doing. I wasn't sure in my career choice and in, in going into the sciences. Um, I was uh, a little hesitant in what I was doing because it wasn't wasn't fun and it was a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, uh, yeah, I just, I was the next guy after he hired this guy. So I, I just, I just looked Rob and said, Hey, are you hiring for anything else? I'm not an artist. And he's like, Oh, we need someone to write letters pages and do uh, press releases. Can you do that? Press and I'm release. like, yes, I can. I'd never done any of that. And, and the right I, I told, <laughs> told the story many times, but I went to crown books, which is a chain of stores that doesn't yeah. exist anymore. And there was a book called How to Write a Press Release. And I used it to create a press release for the signing that Rob had where I met him at that I would have sent out to local press. I faxed it to him that night and he hired me the next day. I can I can see why people would be upset at that origin story because, uh, well, you know, the you weren't a comic book fan. You had no idea Rob Liefeld was. You were there with your nephew and you asked if they were hiring Man, talk about the universe aligning. That's that's crazy that you were hired like that. Twenty years you ago, you had to learn overnight what a press release was. Well, I just went and bought a book. You know, there was a book, How to Write a Press Release, and I went home, read it, and uh, they had like sample releases, so I just made one. I cut mm -hmm. out one of their logos from one of the comics, pasted it on a piece of paper, made a photocopy of it, and then faxed it to them, so it looked like a professional uh, uh, press release. Back in the day, before we had email, there was no email back then. You know, right. I mean, we didn't have cell phones. There was no email. So how would you send out press releases? Well, you fax them to people. <laughs> and then they would retype them when they would put them in their, their publication. You know, that's how fax machines and press worked back in the day. So how did you move from, from doing press releases to, huh, I think I could write a book, right? Like, how, how did that transition happen? That happened over years. I was working at Extreme for two years, and then I became an editor because uh, okay. they had extra books, and, and I was uh, a smart guy, and people listened to me, and, and I had some managerial credibility. And the only other guy in the studio like that was Eric Stevenson, who's now the publisher of Image Comics. So yep. Rob gave Eric Stevenson and I both lines of books. And uh, so I was on Evangeline, uh, what would we do, Battlestar Galactica, you know, those I think were the big ones we did back then. And Eric was doing, you know, Youngblood and Supreme and those and Newman. And uh, but we had a lot of, you know, a lot of various books. Uh, I think it was in 1994 or 1995. There was a marketing comic uh, that was being done called Six String Samurai. It was based on a, a film that was coming out, an independent film that came out in 94 or 95. It was about a rockabilly guy who was on his way to Vegas, you know, and it was in a post-apocalyptic world. Um, and it was this really weird, fun film, but I wrote a one-shot comic for it that came out and uh, it was fun. I had a good time doing it. You know, honestly, for me, a lot of it, I saw a lot of the writers that were being hired and used in comics. And I'm like, I can do that. <laughs> what? I mean, well, see, you, you are a really smart guy, though, because I do appreciate everything that I've read from you, whether it was Postal uh, or Symmetry or, of course, I think Think Tank is probably one of my favorites. Uh, it seems like you go way out of your way to, you know, how do I word this? Uh, show the work, right? Like, um, yeah, it, it's almost like writing a book report and then you have to and then as kids, we have to write, you know, our sources where we got uh, these ideas from. And it seems like you did a lot of work to do all yeah, your I, books. I stole that from Alan Moore. He used to do that on, he did that on uh, V for from Vendetta. Hell. He did it on From Hell. And yeah. uh, I read From Hell. And uh, after I read From Hell, there was that deep dive in the back of all the research he had done. Yeah. And this was before the movie came out. And I remember tracking those books down. I got really interested in it. I don't remember 99% of what I read about it then. or I don't even remember mostly the story from, from Hell at this point. But, um, you know, I loved it at the time. And I really did a deep dive. And I realized that for some people, that's almost as fun as the story itself. So when I did Think Tank, uh, I did that. And I wasn't planning on doing it for all of my books. But it works so well. And people seem to like that so much. This sort of explaining as to who, what, where, and why I was doing what I was doing. What the research was. That the weapon systems I was using, I didn't make up. I think the one thing with my work that people tend to appreciate, uh, well, some do, is that I don't really do superheroes. And most of my people are real you know. and my situations are real. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many cases, a lot of these things are experiences I've, I've, I've dealt with in my own lifetime. And I write about them. Like Colossus, this book I'm doing right now, 
um, is largely based on experiences that my half Asian son had. So you're borrowing from real, from your own personal experiences, huh? Always. And okay. Personal experiences. And then could it be like something you, you read or something you saw? Is, is that where some of your ideas came from? Somebody's asking, where did you get the idea for postal? That's where I was going. Cause I love, um, I can tell you postal postal. I wrote originally as a TV pilot. I didn't write that as a comic uh, about, Four or five years before the first issue of Postal came out, I wrote it as a TV pilot to try to sell it as a TV pilot. I'd worked on the Power Rangers TV show before, Space Patrol Delta, Magic Rangers, and uh, one of the other seasons I wrote for, because I had a buddy that was one of the showrunners. I just, it was just for fun. Mm-hmm. I, I have no real interest in that kind of stuff. But uh, So did I you, wrote Postal. Wait, 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 wait. Did you look before uh, – sorry to interrupt. Did you look into that too because, like, you – did you not – or were you a fan of the, like, the, the Sentai stuff in Japan? No, I wasn't a fan. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I love I how raw that you are, man. That's great. Of, I've only watched a few episodes of Power Rangers, and, and most of them were the ones that I wrote. <laughs> I love the honesty. Thank you. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, Postal. Um, well, Postal, I wrote, like I said, I wrote as a TV pilot. We didn't sell it. And they. Uh, so my manager said, why don't you write this as a graphic novel? So I wrote it as a graphic novel. And then we've sold it now twice as a TV pilot. So um, – Go, go figure, you know, and the TV pilot was essentially the pilot I wrote originally. But uh, no, you know what it was? About 15 years ago, I saw a report about how this guy uh, stole $8 million and went down to the cartels in Mexico and paid them a bunch of money to hide him out. He wasn't hiding. He was publicly high. He was sort of he wasn't hiding. He was let, he, people knew where he was. And he was uh, sort of being flagrant about it. So eventually what happened was the, the cartel got annoyed with him and took him out. They just killed him, took his money. And, and uh, I, I was remember reading about that. And I'm like, well, well, that sucks. I said, if I if I you know stole a bunch of money, uh, I'd, I'd want to live in Malibu. I wouldn't want to live in some you know third world shithole country where I can escape extradition. Right. Uh, so I started thinking about, well, how would I be able to live openly with my ill-gotten gains in the United States if I was able to steal enough to make it worthwhile? And that's where the idea for Postal came from. I started uh, figuring out, okay, what would you need to do? Well. You go to a place like uh, Eden, Wyoming, which is off the grid. You have hackers there that can create a new identity for you. You have uh, a surgeon there that can cut you a new face. You have bankers there that can launder your funds. And uh, so you come in one person, you exit another. And you're a completely legal entity when you're exited. And you go back and do whatever you want. So that's where the idea of proposal came out. Yeah. And then we went from there and we sort of developed, you know, I grew up on military bases. My dad was Air Force. So every two or three years I moved somewhere and we often lived in the middle of nowhere. Um, And my dad wanted to try to give us at least some semblance of normalcy. So we would live in small towns like you you live in Kentucky. I used to live in Warrensburg, Missouri. Um, I've also lived in very small towns all over. I lived in Cheyenne, Wyoming in the suburb. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been in places where there are not a lot of people. And it's weird when you're in a, a town of a few thousand people and you realize that literally everyone knows everyone. If there's any weird and the gossip tree is so fast that if something happens, yeah. it's not even social media. People know everybody's business there, you know, and uh, I just I kind of hated that life. And uh, it's why I, I gravitated more to a bigger metropolitan area like Los Angeles. But uh, it was really interesting to see sort of these microcosm climates, you know, and I, I, you know, I talk to some of these people sometimes that live in some of these small areas and and they have some really strange ideas, you know, Uh, I just got (laughs) to (laughs) roll. Strange ideas is one way of putting it for sure. Uh, So, okay. So you've written stuff by yourself uh, for, uh, I guess it was extreme. Yeah. And Top Cow Comics. Yeah. What is it like? What, what, what's the difference when you're co-writing something with like Mark Silvestri, right? Like he created Cyberforce. But when you guys right. are working together, how different is that? Like how different is that from writing Postal where you can write whatever you want. You you know where the story is going to end. But how is it creating? Well, I guess that is the most superhero book, right? If, if you have to. Yeah. Yeah, we like to refer to cyber forces cybernetically enhanced superhumans, not superheroes. I mean, but uh, I don't. Okay. I've written some of that. I, I uh, to me, our superheroes are cybernetic. They're they're sort of science powered. You look at Hunter Killer, Cyber Force. They're all created. It wasn't Hunter humans. So that. good. So, so yeah, how's the approach for that different? Like, you have to. Like, um, 
Well, I would never write Cyberforce on my own. I think that was that I wouldn't want to. You know, it's just not really my bag. But it's one of those books where I, I like working with Silvestri because he's got a lot of really tight, high-end ideas. Um, I, I like writing with Mark because his he has these huge just ideas that are massive in scope. Um, and uh, I tend to be a nuts and bolts sort of detail guy. So when you find, I think when you have people that write together, that you need to find people that complement each other. And in, in situations like that, usually in a situation like if it's Mark and I co-writing something, mm -hmm. it would probably be the two of us sitting in a room and chatting for a while. And I would take notes and then I would bounce drafts to him, you know, and I would do the legwork. But on Cyberforce, it was actually the reverse because he wrote this physical drafts. So, you know, we've we've done I've, I've, I've uh, co-written with Brian Hill, Ryan Katie. Uh, a lot of times when I bring in co-writers on my projects, it's because I'm, uh, I'm too busy and I need someone to help me just get it done. Um, and uh, a lot. So what I'll do with Ryan, Katie, Brian Hill, or a few other people I work with is I, I will just I'll say, hey, uh, I'm this far in this. I need to get it done. Here's what I need to do. Can you write the last 40 pages for me? You know, and then I'll yeah. share credit for the whole thing. That's that's more of a, a, a deadline thing. Um, mm -hmm. I try to avoid doing that for the most part. I prefer I prefer to have uh, I, I think in my opinion, almost every film, TV show, novel, for the most part, the best of the best, usually your one creative vision. Yeah, I can see that. Like, I mean, uh, there are times when co I, I can think off the top of my head of like creators I always want to see working together, but it's like maybe one hand I can count as like those type of creators. They just work so well with each other. It's, it's really rare. And it's, I, I was just thinking like, okay, Silvestri created those characters. So he knows the way they're supposed to be. But you, I mean, you've, you've been in the top cow world for a long time. I mean, you wrote Aphrodite. Uh, yeah. So it's not like you're unfamiliar with the characters. It does help to have written some things in the, in that per, uh, particular universe. Yeah, it helps a lot. And of course, I've read everything, and uh, you know, so and Cyberforce is uh, is a massive uh, sales success for us. You know, if you look at the thirty years of that property, we've sold hundreds of millions of copies. You know, so that's that's a worldwide, internationally known brand and uh, published in twenty seven languages, fifty seven countries. Um, the uh, Kickstarter we just did, which generated a quarter million in, in nostalgia reprint, you know, we're, we're looking at two to three times that by the time we do our full international worldwide reprint of the first hardcover. So okay. it's, uh, it's an exciting time. I mean, it, it, it's really an interesting time because for comics, uh, I tell people this all the time. I think the barrier to entry in comics is lower than it's ever been. It's easier right now to get your comic published than it ever has been. It's harder than it's ever been to actually make any money doing so. So oh, well, that's um, so heartbreaking. Yeah, but I'm just saying that's the reality because with, yeah, with web comics right. and web crowdfunding comics. and so many things, if you want to publish a comic, it's very easy to do. You might not make a dime doing it, but you could publish it. You're you're absolutely right. There are so many people that have published their own, like you know, back in the '80s and '90s, like when my, my friends and I were trying to like make our own comic books, it was near impossible, and it was it cost you an arm and a leg to send out physical copies of your artwork, of your writing to different publishers, and right. it's heartbreaking, you know, when nobody gets back to you, when nobody, you know, it, 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 it's just a heartbreaking thing. So now we have this capability of self-publishing, and I think it's great. Like, so many people can have their own book, and I, think, and, I, and I think it's very commendable for people that get up off their ass to do it to begin with. That is the, everybody talks about it. Like, you know, growing up, I think most of my friends and I that read comics, were all like, we're going to make comics one day. It is so much harder than that. Than like, even when you're self-publishing, it's getting yeah. up and doing it. All right, Matt, obviously I'm a collected editions guy. So here comes the hardball questions, brother. So I was going to have you and Mark on to talk about the cyber force Kickstarter, but Mark is busy doing a project. I don't think I can say because I don't know if it's out there or not that he's doing. Oh, his, his Batman thing was announced. Batman. Okay, so it was announced. Okay, now he, yes. So he is doing Batman. So he's not allowed to talk to anybody until he's finished with Batman, which is great. Right. So um, on this channel, we my my fans and I, my my subscribers, my viewers love collected editions. So I was really excited when I saw Cyberforce hardcover. And the big question that I've been getting asked was is the cyber force hardcover going to be oversized or if it's going to be standard edition size and yeah uh i guess i could ask you do you well do let you me ask you do you have a preference do i 
me. Do I have a present? Yo, the bigger, the better, baby. Yes. Uh, oversized is the way that I appreciate. Like when we're talking about Mark is my favorite artist of all time. Dan Sam, right. my favorite artist of all time. So when given the chance of getting uh, books in oversized format for the art that I enjoy, I tend to choose oversized over right. standard size. Because um, I, I got, agree with you. you do? I agree with you. But okay. uh, Mark prefers his reprint stuff be in the standard format size. So Cyberforce and Darkness were all in the normal hardcover size. Yeah. And the Act 99 Postal uh, and the ones – and Sunstone were all oversized. Yeah, so I did notice a we difference. Do uh, we do both. And that's so, a preference issue. Mark likes his a certain way. I like mine a certain way. Okay, yeah. Uh, I kind of figured with Witchblade and Darkness when they were coming out, uh, being standard size, that perhaps Cyber Force was going to be standard size as well. Um, yes, it okay. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to lie that. That hurts a little, but that's okay. Still going to get it. But is there any, like, future for further volumes, like any more uh, Darkness, Volume 3, Witchblade Volume 3? Are you talking about the Kickstarter volumes? Yeah. Well, because yeah, the they were... Yeah, we're doing all of them. Yeah, the plan is to do all of them um, in both Witchblade, Darkness, and Cyberforce. Okay. Um, and we're continuing to do hardcovers uh, for Sunstone, Swang, and the other book books that we have on that side that mm -hmm. sell really well. So I think I think all the ones that sort of fit into that one little universe will be – Aphrodite was a large size. That was the first one we did. But yeah. in the organized campaigns that we've done with the Kickstarters, uh, we have done them standard sized. I, I, I'm with you. I actually I, – look, it's a mixed bag. I, we get this – it's a preference thing that a lot of people uh, – there are a lot of people that bitch about the oversized. I had a lot of people complain to me about the oversized hardcovers. Really? Fans or people from the inside? Both. Really? That's a that's surprising. Like I don't know. I just like I I tend to like things oversized. Like you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of omnibus editions. I'm not saying they all have to be 30, 40 issues in each book. Of course, I love them to be, but at least the artwork to me just is presented in the bigger format is so amazing. Um. So how what? Okay, what the. What made you guys decide to do Kickstarter for some series and then things like, like you mentioned, like Sunstone and Postal immediately were published by Image in hardcover format. What made you guys decide, okay, let's try Cyberforce's Kickstarter? Because Cyberforce to me is a sure bet. Like that was one of the staple series that came out with from Image, yeah. right? Yeah. No, Postal was a Kickstarter. The Postal hardcover was a Kickstarter. It was one of the first. Oh, that's things right. It was Kickstarter first, and, right? Uh, uh, Aphrodite 9 was not. The reason why Aphrodite 9 was done was because that was the first time I did that Middle East Comic Con and uh, in Dubai, and that convention bought a thousand copies of that hardcover Aphrodite one in advance, mm -hmm. which paid for the entire run. So um, I was able to make a deal for that one on that, which is why that one exists. We started doing the uh, Kickstarters and the nostalgia reprint stuff, honestly, as a build for the 30th anniversary. But also because uh, we started to realize that there was just a demand for it. We just kept getting more and more people. And it's shifted because uh, we used to do mainly the 32-page books. If you look at the trade paperbacks and collected editions, we didn't do very many of these in the 90s at all. You know what I mean? I mean, it wasn't until the mid-2000s where you see us kind of putting our, our line of books into trades. And uh, so, you know, there's different formats. I, I, I believe in trying to put out um, – a value price thing because you know like you said the omnibus or a cheap individual introductory trade paperback is a great way to get somebody to try something free online digital is a great way to get someone to try something and then you can do the 50 to 80 dollar hardcover you know like omnibus whatever you want to call it uh when someone's a big fan and i think that's what we've realized and the other great thing is if you look at there's only 2200 people that pledged the cyberforce kickstarter but we made almost two hundred thousand dollars. you know i mean right. so it's sort of a it just it's it's a bad it's bad it honestly Kickstarter Substack and a lot of this stuff not great for I would say comic retail overall you know um, but it's just it's just a shifting and when I mean comic I mean comic store retail there uh, you know and and that's been a yeah I mean when I first started in comics I was given a list that was like fifteen thousand stores you know um, I think there's like eight hundred now that order a full line of books. There's like 2,000 stores, supposedly, accounts that they claim that Diamond says they have. But, uh, you know, there's only 
eight or 900 of them that actually carry a full line of comics. So, you know, that's why Amazon, like a book like Sunstone, you know, Sunstone, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but it's a different book. Oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Sunstone. Love Sunstone sells almost nine out of 10 copies through Amazon. So we're doing maybe one out of 10 sales through the direct market. Nine out of 10 copies of the hardcover or the, well, the, 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 the regular graphic novels? The trades. Okay. The trades. That's They're all sold through uh, almost exclusively through Amazon and through other like Books a Million and, and Barnes and Noble. I mean, we've got very little. Our orders into comic book stores directly for some of those uh, books. And I understand they're mature content. They, you know, they've got sexually explicit material in it. That's where um, I used to go for my mature content was comic book stores. They should be carrying this stuff. You would think. It's like you judge a good comic store to smut. And by the way, oh, it's not, it's not smut. I love it. <laughs> um, you know, and then some, some stores, like, and, and some bookstores sometimes don't realize what they have because I've, I've seen, like, uh, Sunstone put in the YA section by mistake. I, I always fix it because I'm like, I don't I, know. I, I, yeah, well, ours is in the uh, top shelf here at the house, <laughs> uh, away from the kids. It's beautiful artwork, and they'll be like, oh, that looks Great really book. cool. What's yeah. happening here? Uh, so, what you said really, really, and I'm not towards you, but it really bothers me uh, when things like that are sold nine copies out of the 10 copies for Sunstone. Because uh, so a lot of things have happened, right? Like the, the whole diamond shift has happened, of course, uh, where the, you know they lost DC, they lost Marvel. So people from retailers aren't ordering as many because their discounts aren't as big as they used to be. And therefore us the consumers the people that are buying from retailers whether they're online retailers or whether they're comic book stores aren't getting the discounts we used to as well meaning the bookstores are taking advantage of that so when diamond releases their numbers or we're able to get numbers i don't think prh releases numbers of like the top selling graphic novels you always see the numbers are down but they, we never see the book market end of that yeah I don't think there is a true statistic anymore for what books no. sell because, you know, if you look at it, because it, yeah, you look at a book like say Cyberforce and the, the vast bulk of Cyberforce books have been sold through the direct market. Then suddenly we do this Kickstarter, which is a direct to fan thing. And, you know, uh, but we did sell a significant amount of hardcovers into the direct market as well. I, I, I was, you know, and the Amazon front, I, I think the problem with Amazon is just it's just shipping is where everybody gets so, you know, it's difficult. For whatever reason, Amazon is still able to ship shit cheaper than anyone else can, you know. Because if we're Two trying days. to ship Two days. You can't yeah. like, nobody can compete with that. They yeah, might it's, ship it's, like crap, but you're still getting your books in two days, you know. Like yeah, there's no, there's no padding in your beautiful forty nine ninety nine, you know, dollar books because that's the way they ship things. Yeah. But at least you get your books in two days and you have the option of returning it. Um, so Cyberforce Kickstarter. You're hoping that you and Mark have talked about, you know, with volume one, will that be available through the direct market then later on? Optional yeah. for people, comic book stores, we were, online retailers? We did, that, we did that for every Kickstarter hardcover. Every single Kickstarter hardcover we've done has been available through every channel. We've not made them exclusive to Kickstarter. We've just made a Kickstarter cover. So there's a dust jacket that's different for the Kickstarter variant. And then in the back of the book, we list all the Kickstarter supporters. But the Kickstarter supporters are in every book, including the ones that go out to the direct market. But uh, we'll sell it into the direct market. We'll sell it into the book trade. I mean, that'll have a different cover on it. And, uh, you know, so, and go ahead. I was going to say, so then everybody has a chance of purchasing the book in case they miss the Kickstarter. Yes. Okay. Awesome. The Kickstarters are great because we offer a little, uh, a lot of extra little merchandise. There's usually oh, some pretty good deals you can get if you're an early adopter, and uh, you know, there's usually T-shirts and fun stuff. And we've sort of adjusted over time, trying to do different things to see what people are into. And uh, it's interesting, you know. One of the highest demanding items that we have is the uh, the Darkness guitar pick. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Which is weird, you know. Okay, so then this is another important thing. As as again, my channel mainly focuses on collected editions. Um, I know some people had a hard time finding a copy of like Darkness Volume Two. I think sometimes when they sell out and they go out of print, is are will they come back into a second printing in that format, or are you gonna looking at at soft cover formats? 
don't know. I mean, the problem is, is it's so ridiculously expensive to print hardcovers. I mean, you're paying between eight and 14 bucks a book plus shipping, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of money to pay for a printing. So if I, and if I need to print four or 5,000 because I have two 2,500 Kickstarter orders and I need to print another thousand for the direct market. But if I'm going back to do a reprint, you know, a lot of times when you do reprint orders, you're talking about a few hundred. So then the publisher is taking all the risk by publishing these books. You know, I was the first one to do sort of these big, uh, omnibuses in the U S if you go back into the nineties, late two thousands, I have done it with Rising stars, you know what that I mean? Was great. Not the first time ever you've done anything like that. Not only not only did you do the big thick rising stars and midnight nation, but you did like a pre-absolute absolute size books for top cow books too. Like um, so yeah. it was like uh, you were experimenting with what was working. I, I will say though, Matt, like I don't think people were ready then, but I think this is a completely different time now. Now people would be happy with definitely like an absolute like edition, you know, the big tall books uh, that are bigger than the omnibus editions of like of the works that you guys have put out just because right. it's nostalgia to them. These things came out 10, 15. Oh, my goodness. Cyber Force. I don't even want to think about 30 that. years. The problem with Cyber Force, by the way, and one of the reasons one of the reasons that did factor into not printing it in an oversized book was we had to recreate a lot of those pages because a lot of them were corrupted over the years in terms of archiving. We archived, uh, you know, we've been doing this 30 years. We had stuff on PsyQuest disc. We had stuff on floppy disc. We had stuff, oh. on, C we had stuff on every format possible. So when we finally started collating it all to put it in the cloud, uh, we realized that about a third of everything that we had on all those media was, was corrupted. So um, we've sort of been systematic. It's part of the reason why we didn't do it. We were planning on doing a 25th anniversary Cyber Force edition. This, 30th anniversary Cyber Force edition was initially planned as the 25th anniversary. Oh, the image <laughs> Incredible amount of difficulty uh, with the files. So uh, yeah. Vince Longo, who is one of our production guys and editor here, uh, he went back and recreated a third of the book. Wow. That is a, yeah, I think uh, like for Marvel and DC, they actually outsource like for like these big companies to come in and restore artwork, whether it's silver age, golden age, even the stuff from like the eighties. Right. And I remember talking to Eric Larson about this. I'm like, wait, you know, are your fans really want a hardcover of Savage Dragon? And he said the exact same thing about people archiving that stuff. And the masters are just, you know, they would have to be touched up a lot. And that's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. It took him a year to put the Cyber Force hardcover together. A year. That's a yeah. year of this guy's work part time. It's a long time, man, and it's and it's got to be, you know, a uh, definitely a labor of love too. Like you have to enjoy what you're looking at, what you're working with. I think it would, um, yeah, looking at the same images all the time. So, Matt, um, you mentioned Colossus. Let's talk about that. What exactly is Colossus? I know is that the book you're currently working on. Yeah, it's a book I just finished. It just went to uh, Image a few days ago. Uh, it's actually called The Clay People, colon, Colossus, so we don't get sued, sued for the X-Men Colossus. Uh, <laughs> but The Clay People is a heavy metal band, and I've, I've been working with a, a new video game group called Epitome Studios, and uh, they're doing Quiet Place game and doing some other stuff. Um, and uh, the guy, Rich Leibowitz, uh, I've been working with for decades on various things. He was the one that initially helped me set, to get, set up the uh, Darkness video game deal with uh, Majesco that then went to 2K, which became the uh, two Darkness video games that we had. So I've been working with him for a long time, and he wanted to develop some content, uh, and I've been helping him with that. And he showed me this heavy metal band called Clay People. I, I was, I'm not really a metalhead, so I wasn't familiar with them, but the lead singer came from a band called Owl, which is very well known. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have sort of their hardcore fans. And uh, Rich just said, hey, I really like the lyrics to the song. Do you think you'd be interested in turning this into a comic book? And so I looked it up and I watched the, the, the video. And if you watch the video online, it's got a bunch of uh, public domain Godzilla and Gojira and Kaiju stuff in it. That's what the video has. It has the band singing and then that. Um, but then I read the lyrics and I started looking at it. And I'm like, you know that's really not how I envisioned what the song was about. And, uh, you know, I talked to the guy who wrote the song and I said, you know, I, I really see this song. I read these lyrics to me. It speaks of like uh, emo culture, drug use, yeah. addiction and stuff like that. And he's like, uh, there's a lot of that. In there. 
And I'm like, okay. So I, I came up with my story and initially I, I gotta be honest, I was a little surprised that they approved it because it had so little to do initially with what the song was and what the song was about. But I used the lyrics very well, I think. I, I'm really proud of the story. Uh, long story short, it's about, uh, it starts in uh, Dachau in, in the Nazi Germany, um, where the US army shows up in 1945 and frees the, uh, the Jewish prisoners, the prisoners of war. Um, and there's a guy in there who ha is down in Dr. Rasher Mangale clone is having doing experiments on some of these people. They go down and they find it. And one of the guys, the, Jew, uh, the Jews that was there being uh, tortured, he's still alive. And, and they find him. And he had this book that the Nazis would find. The Nazis were obs obsessed with the cult culture. So uh, yeah. the idea of a uh, clay golem, the golem myth from uh, Jewish history. Yeah. I knew this because of the X-Files episode. That's the only reason I knew that the uh, the Gollum Jewish thing existed. There was a, an X-Falls episode called Kadish, and uh, it was about some neo-Nazis giving some Jews a hard time. And so they created this Gollum that went out and killed the neo-Nazis. Very simple retribution. Um, and so I looked at it and I realized, all right, you know, and I kind of created some of my own because, like I said, I was a military brat. So when we moved around a lot, um, I would often be the target of ridicule at some of these schools because they just, you know, if you're in a town of, if you're in a high school of 600 people, you know, and that's, uh, and that was K to 12, by the way, that's not a high school. It's K to 12, 600 people, you know, everyone knows everyone. And uh, I, I was uh, not treated well by some, uh, you know, big, big farm boys, big white dudes. And uh, I, I had some problem in the late seventies with these guys. They, you know, and one of them stole my 10 speed and one guy, it, it became an issue when one of them decided to beat the shit out of me. And they were three or four years older than me. So it wasn't a hell of a lot I could do about it. You know what I mean? But um, right. And my son being half Asian, I, I've often told white people that I that'll listen to me. I'm like, you know what? You don't really understand what racism is until you feel it through the eyes of your child. You know, I mean, if you want to be a white person to truly understand what racism feels like, have an interracial child and, and have that kid be uh, treated that way. Because I got to tell you, you feel that shit, man. I mean, it's it's not it's not uh, theoretical anymore. It's not the idea of you know this, but when you see your child in tears at age eight because he doesn't understand why someone doesn't like him because he's a little darker than this other kid that's a it's a hard thing to deal with you know and, and you know i look at my eight-year-old son who said who wishes he, he he tells me you know dad i wish i looked more like you you know how heartbreaking that is as a father you know what i mean and he doesn't feel that way anymore but i mean that and i live in culver city california and my children have been raised in the same school district since birth and i did that because i hated my life i hated the way i was i was a nomadic in all these military bases all over the place uh i didn't ever make any friends so my son stayed in the same school district for k-12 and uh you know and culver city is about as multicultural as you can get in fact uh, that book symmetry i wrote i, I yeah. essentially came up with the idea because of the high school my sons go to oh really yeah. So you, man, you do, you do borrow from life. I love it. Cause you know, you hear most writers talk about, well, I don't think it's, it's true anymore. You, you, there is a, there's a split decision here. Like, like, like the, some writers will say, write what you know. And then some writers are like, write what you don't know. So you can learn about things. Right. Uh, and I think it's the same with comics, comics. Like uh, I've heard uh, Gail Simone talk about, you know, write the things you don't know crap about. So you could go and learn about these things and do the research. So I feel like it's a little, I don't know, maybe it's a mix for you, right? Like it's things you don't know about. You go, because you like researching these things no. and then things that you do know about too, because they hit close to home. Yeah. What I what I say to people is I say, write what you want to know about or want yeah, to learn. It's a good way you know, of putting I, it. Because, I, 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 you know, it's, write what you don't know about. There's all kinds of stuff. I don't give two shits about sailing and sailing knots and that Moby Dick chapter I can live my whole life with never reading again. You know, and so... <laughs> I don't give a fuck about sailing and sailing knots and nautical miles and bullshit. So I don't want to write about that. But I did want to learn about wildfires in California and how they work. So I wrote a book called Wildfire. You know, I wanted to learn more about how drones were working and how research science worked. And I wrote Think Tank. You know, I mean, uh, you so pick good. various things, you know, with uh, transhuman. After 99 was all about transhumanism. Oh, man. And that book. I remember when that book came out and I got the, the hardcover edition of that and it was so awesome. That's why I was hoping that they would do more hardcovers like that in that format. Well, I, you'll see all the ones I do will be in that format. Cause I like that format. 
my man. I like the way you think. Um, so uh, Colossus, I'm sorry, Clay People Colossus. Uh, very cool that how that that or that is a cool origin story for that book. How it all right. came together. And it's like a combination of everything that was going on in your life with your son, and then the song. That's yeah, that's cool. And then of well, course the X, sort of X Files. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just you know I I have found that music and art uh, there tends to be a layer. There's a layer beyond it that uh, if you really push like fans or, or, or other creators can see kind of the other layer of what the people were talking about or what they were doing. And that's the content that I always tend to gravitate towards is the stuff I can learn from. I, I actually try to read stuff on a regular basis that makes me incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and because uh, there's something fascinating about reading things that you make you physically uncomfortable, you know, and uh, I was like I said, I was, you know, I know we weren't going to talk too much politics, but I was raised a right wing evangelical Christian, you know, and I, I'm now sort of a, a slightly left to center liberal uh, atheist. You know, I mean, how many people do you know that do that track in their lifetime? I don't know. seems like. Uh, My parents and, were hardcore Christians until they died. So I, I'm trying to think of like some of my friends, right? Like my friends that uh, sons, sons and daughters of like Baptist preachers or. Uh, but I don't know what your relationship. You mentioned your dad um earlier but your relationship with your parents seemed like it was a good relationship though right yeah no my parents were good parents my dad worked a lot so he wasn't around much when i was a little kid um but mm -hmm. uh no I, I had a good relationship with my folks uh, i didn't really have an issue with them i mean my dad was a bit of a trumper and i i i was less a fan of that obviously uh but uh you know you know i i unlike everyone else that seems in this world i'm okay with live and let live you know i mean mm -hmm. uh you can do whatever the fuck you want just don't don't kill me for what i believe Oh, absolutely. Right. I, I've, I've always been like that. I don't judge people on their religious beliefs or political beliefs. You know, I, it just, it, to me, how do I put it? I'm, I'm not a fan of grouping people together under one thing because that's just, I, I you know, I, I judge the individuals. So I, I know it's kind of crazy too. Uh, but then what can we expect with, Clay people colossus then maybe some kind um, of it's, collection it's uh it's it's a one-off book i mean it's about uh bullying you know mm -hmm. which but I, i'm not trying to do it as an over heavy-handed thing and i think if people are gonna look at this a little bit and and uh sometimes i wonder if people read stuff and they think it's 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 being inflated or exaggerated but the thing is with this specific book i can tell you these things happen to me. I mean, not being murdered, but uh, I mean, I, I I had a tremendously difficult time as a kid in the late 70s, and early 80s in some of these small rural environments because they just did not like me because I was a military kid. I was from California at that point. Before we moved to the Midwest, we were in Vandenberg, which is uh, up in central California. Um, so they called me California crud everywhere I went. So... <laughs> But uh, no, the point is, I, I think Colossus is a fun book. I think it's got uh, a little bit of something for everyone. Christian Dabari did some amazing artwork. And when I say fun, I don't mean fun in a, it's a laugh comedy, right? Because, you know, it has the Holocaust and uh, yeah. bullying and ultimately a, a terrible revenge and retribution story. So it's not, uh, it's not laugh out loud hilarious. But uh, um, no, it was a, it was an interesting book to do. And I try to do different types of things. And I try to, I try to, one of my things I've always tried to do is I try to open people's eyes a little bit to certain things, you know, because uh, I, I think everyone is overly offended these days. You know what I mean? I, I think everyone I'm a firm believer of the harm principle. I'm less so less so of the offense principle. You know, I studied these in college and in philosophy class and the harm principle is a legit thing. You hurt people. You should not do that. But the, the offense principle is so fascinating to me. Uh, it's almost become more important to people than the harm principle because, you know, people get shot up in schools every day now. People get shot all the time and no one gives a fuck. But, uh, you know, you take a position on some political issue and everyone floods the world with Twitter, Twitter rants. You know what I mean? I mean, it just seems so hilarious to me how uh, what we sort of uh, pay attention to and focus on as a society seems to be ass backwards to me. And I think that's where some people like really enjoy comics, right? Like I, I, as a kid. I was much like you, you know, I was bullied. I didn't speak the language uh, and I handled things my way by 
escaping to the world of X-Men. And, right. and you mentioned something because, you know, I have kids and uh, I think I've come to learn and working in the school system, kids, no matter what, and this is something I've tried to teach my daughters, no matter what, kids are going to find a way to make fun of you, find a way to hurt you. And that's just, the, I, I hate to say it, but that's just, that's yeah. just part of growing up. You will find like, no matter you got freckles, you're skinny, you're fat, you're white, black. It doesn't matter. Like kids will find a way to pick on you and, yeah. and bring you down. And you got to be better than that. You got to be above that. And it's so hard because it is heartbreaking. Like you said, uh, like having your son that like, I don't know how much rage I would have. If that's something. I mean, my, my girls, girls are a little bit different than boys, right? Like I'm not saying girls are not mean no, because they are, uh, but boys tend to be a little more in your face about it, about making fun of you. Right. Uh, girls are more low key. Then again, it's a whole different era too. Back in my day, we used to get into fist fights. Now it's social media and right. you know blasting, blasting. I think that's what the kids call it, <laughs> working each other. Uh, you know, through social media, it's it's kind of it's a it's a different world, that's for sure. And yeah. both my my oldest daughter and her friends were talking about like, yeah, we wish we kind of lived in the nineties where there wasn't social media. It seems like everybody's just angry at each other. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah the 90s has its ups and downs, you know? It had its ups and downs for sure. Well, um, the, problem is, the problem is is uh, the communities that people find everywhere aren't always positive. You know, like if you were a crazy, lone, you know, Q QAnon crazy person 30 years ago, you didn't find another 2,000 people online that you all went to their message boards and hung out and had little conventions with. That's what people do today. It doesn't matter what fringe fucking belief you have. There's a thousand other people that believe the same stupid thing, whether it's flat earth or whatever it is. They have their own websites, their own message boards, and they have their own social media groups. And uh, it's become an echo chamber where people basically, instead of being faced with uh, reality and rational and critical thinking, people are being echoed. Everything's an echo chamber now. So if you have a what would have been a fringe belief 25 years ago, today... Uh, people are championing that as uh, being a valid subsection of things, and it's not. Different, different world. Back then, yeah, you you would have to find a uh, a common friend that believed the same thing you did. Like, uh, I I mean, that's the way it was for comics, though. Like for me, not a lot of people like after grade school and went into going into middle school. A lot of my friends started dropping comics around that time. So finding someone that was into the same thing that I was into was like a magical moment. Like, Oh yeah. dude, you go to my school and I see him at the comic book store. Right. That yeah. was cool. And I figured yeah. with now would be a lot easier. Like I'm going to go on Facebook and I'm going to join a comic book group. We're going to be talking about comics, but you're right. Like you just can't get away from some things in real life. Unfortunately. Well, and I mean, it's great for that. Like if you want to be a fan of Halo and be in a community of like-minded Halo fans and, and argue about which you know, where the Master Chief is cool or not, you, you know, knock yourself out. The problem is when people have these weird fringe beliefs like, uh, you know, vaccines don't work or, or this, that or the other thing. And then they, they sort of start perpetrating it in areas with other people that have similar warped views. And then they start thinking because they have numbers that they're that they're uh, that their beliefs actually have value and merit, you know. One of the things that's gone out of the wayside in this country is uh, experts. You know, we used to have experts on things. And, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talked about you need to spend 10,000 hours doing something to be an expert. Well, I, I would say the majority of these morons giving their medical opinions online. How many of you think of our actual experts have any real medical experience? Or do you think they just read some stupid thing online and they're parodying it because they think they're fucking genius? You know what I mean? I mean, these are the people that just I was like and it's on both sides of the political spectrum. Do you know what I mean? Where people just read something and they think they're an expert. And this is the thing that irritates me a lot. And now that I'm running this Top Cow Talent Hunt, uh, it is it is fascinating to me how many people think they can write a comic book and how few people can actually do it. You know, I get told all the time that I have an easy job, and I'm like, okay, fuck you, but okay, you know. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's easy. I don't think being a comic book writer, a comic book artist, is easy. I, I really do think it, it. It. You know, and I've. I. I I'm not a published author and I'm not a published artist. I think you give a lot of your heart and soul into this. You put a lot of yourself into these stories and that can't be easy when 
you know, so when you see cells or something like that, or something working, something not working, it's got to be, you know, detrimental to your mental health to, to put so much of yourself into a story. And then it's, you know, people, people not picking it up, but then there's the other part, like, Oh my gosh, people are talking about my book. That's great. Right. I love it. I think, I think that's, that's phenomenal. I'm not going to, I'm not saying it's an easy job, but I do have to say it's one of the best jobs to me, at least in the world would be to something to create something out of nothing and then have a following people coming up to you at conventions going, man, you know, this, like there was somebody here that was writing about postal. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, yes. Right here. Purple, uh, purple ring. Uh, thanks for the insight, Mike Hawkins. Strangely enough, I read Postal while dealing with the death in the family, so it holds a special spot for me. Things like that is what I mean. Like that's a very rewarding message. Like that you, you know, part of you is now staying with Purple Rain. I know it sounds ridiculous to say that, but that's his name. His username. All, All good. Yeah, yeah. So that's great. I love that. Like that's a very rewarding thing, right? right. It, it, you get that. And, um, and this has been a deep conversation. Let me uh, let me get to the chat here for a second. Let's see. We got Kevin oh, Collins. Right. Thank you so much. Can I, can I make one point on, on what you just said? Um, it, is uh, I actually love it when people talk to me about the stuff that I, I, that reflects my real life. And very rarely does it come out in a negative way. What is strange is on occasion I will have someone tell me that they didn't find something realistic or they didn't think someone would say something like that. And when it is based on a real life experience, it's weird for people to tell me it's not realistic, you know, and there was a lot of that in book like Swing, you know, where there was a lot of things that I personally saw or people told me or related things and I included in that, that kind of story. And that was a little different because it's it's about sex. But, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating when someone comes and I had this, by the way, someone came up and told me uh, that one of the stories I did with David Lauren, the think tank character, who is a character that I'm the only person who has ever written. No one's ever written that character but me. And I based that a lot on my father, who was in the military and, and did that stuff. And uh, it was fascinating for me to come up, for a guy to come up and tell me that he thought that that character did a story that wasn't very realistic for the character. And I was just like looking at him and I, you know, at some point, I don't argue with people anymore because if, they, if they're going to buy my stuff and interpret however they want, what do I care? You know, if they want to talk to me about it, I'll talk to them about it. But when people come at me with negativity, I tend to... Uh, just bleed it off and ignore it. You know what I mean? If people ask me questions and want to find out things, I will answer and engage. And, uh, you know, if people tell me they like it, I, I like that too. But I, I prefer when people ask questions and want to know, you know, because I enjoy talking about these things. It's yeah. great being, I love this book or I love that book. Um, and, you know, sometimes when people say, you know, I, I really didn't like this. And this is the funny thing is um, like a book like Swing and Sunstone, we have gotten some really negative reviews for those books. And uh, most of the reviews are incredibly positive. But I realized when you go in and you look at the reviews for some of these books, you realize the people didn't like the content itself, what it was about. The fact that Sunstone is about two lesbian women in an SM relationship together. So because of that premise, they hate it before it even gets read. Okay. So uh, saying that, I, I will say having uh you know working on on the channel doing this stuff talking about specific books i love talking about comics i love talking about the stories i love talking about art uh you know sometimes i think you're right like sometimes people don't like a certain thing like and, and immediately like we'll give a negative review oh yeah that's crap or something right like it, it's 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 about two lesbians having sex gross having never read the book right so immediately it wasn't for them and right. I find that interesting how people, I don't know. I like having an opinion about something that I've actually tried to read. I mean, if, well, I, if I want to make fun of something, then you damn well better believe I try to watch it or I try to read it. Yeah. And, and it wasn't for me. And I, you know, but I think I have a hard time talking to people that come and say, you know, this, I, I you flat out just saying, I've never read this book, but it's just not for me. I don't like the message it's trying to give me. Well, that's fine. I'm fine with that. If this book is not for me because it's not for me, it's, it's a fine reason across the board. What I hate is when people say, this book sucks. And they, they've never read it and, and they don't know anything about it. And uh, and, and they're doing that. And see, the thing is, I, I read 
I don't. I stopped reading comic book reviews about ten years ago, and uh, the main reason. Do what? I say good for you. Oh, and the reason is because I never got anything out of it. I, I, I would read seven or eight. You know, I'd go to comicbookup.com or whatever it is, and I'd look at all the reviews, and I'd see that most of them were positive. But then I would, I get like a bunch of positive ones, but of course, the one negative one, I would go and obsess on it, and yeah. uh, then I would go read it, and I would talk to some friends. And I realized I was wasting a lot of unnecessary time, and it wasn't affecting my sales, and it wasn't improving my my skill. Uh, it was doing nothing for me other than giving me anxiety. So I just stopped reading them entirely. I haven't read a comic book review in years. The people at Image go through reviews and grab pull quotes, which is what they use on the back of the books. Mm -hmm. And on occasion, someone will tag me and stuff, and I'll see stuff like that. No one ever really tags me in negative reviews. So when someone tags me in a review or something like that, I'll go take a look real quick and see if there's something in there worth using. Um, and we'll get little pull quotes. We have a... <laughs> Thank you so much for the super chat, Gilly Writes Comics. Gilly's an independent creator. Did uh, Galactic Rodents of Mayhem. It's on Kickstarter now. And they were kind enough to send me a copy of it. And this is what I mean. Like, it, this is, it was a, it's a fun book. And just getting off your butt and doing it is so cool. I'm, it's it's very admirable, the people that do this. Um, it's a love letter to Nostalgia Center around three unapologetic rat race capybaras. Um, all right. So... We've talked about the current book. Uh, what and then what? What else are you working on these days? What's uh, what's after the Colossus or Clay People Colossus? Sorry, Colossus comes out uh, May sixteenth or March sixteenth. I have uh, Swing Volume Five, which comes out in May. Um, I'm working on a book called Zero G, which is about gravity. Um, and uh, what else am I working on? I'm working on a book called Arc, which is about poaching. Arc oh. is called Animal Rights Coalition. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so different things I've, I've found interesting. Um, what else am I working on? There's other stuff I'm working on too. I don't know why I'm blanking on it. Busy um, guy. Busy guy. That's good. I'm doing after, oh, I'm doing a new Aphrodite nine because, uh, Mark is doing a new darkness. Um, we have a new Witchblade book coming out at some point and, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do cyber force and Aphrodite again, probably in the following year or year after that. And I think Mark probably do Aphrodite or Mark will probably do cyber force again. And I'll probably do Aphrodite again. Any any chance for more collected editions of things from the Top Cow universe? Like uh, you mentioned Hunter Killer, and I really enjoyed that book. Uh, and yes. I don't hear very many people talk about it, but I feel like with a hardcover coming out and a specific channel called Nearman Condition telling people, hey, this is really good. You ought to check out this hardcover. People would uh, be like, hey, I need to check that book out. Or, yeah. or any oh. other book, any other book, any other lines like that that you guys have thought about doing? Uh, well, pretty much anything that we have that uh, Hunter Killer, Codename Strike Force, Weapon Zero, we're trying to figure out how to get copies of those out. Like Weapon Zero and Codename Strike Force are under the same problem we had with Cyber Force. We're having to recreate content uh, from the mm -hmm. 90s. It's usually the content from like 93 to 97 that went bad, which is a bad time for it, you know, because that's a, there's a lot of really nostalgic. That's a lot of the image launch books was 93 to 97. So there's a lot of those yeah. that we don't have. Um, and uh, so we need to recreate those. So, uh, you know, we continue to support the core brands. Like to me, there's sort of three lines of books that we have in the Top Cow universe. We have the Witchblade Darkness universe, which includes, cyber, has a Cyber Force and Hunter Killer, which are our technological branch. Then it has Witchblade and Darkness and those characters, which are the supernatural branch. It's all part of the quote, quote unquote Top Cow universe. We have the Edenverse, which is Postal, Think Tank, the Tithe, and anything else I decided to throw in there. Um, and uh, Stairway was in that as well, which is another science fiction book I'm doing. Uh, we're probably going to do more Postal and more Think Tank. I'm, I'm working on a new Think Tank now, and that'll be oh. the next Edenverse title. Uh, and then the last book we have is the what I call the Sedgwick First, you know, and that's Sunstone, Swing, Sugar, Punderworld, Bloodstain. And not all of those are uh, sex books. I mean, Punderworld is not, and neither is Bloodstain. But uh, these are all books that take place in the same little quote unquote universe in the real world for the most part. Um, and the way the characters know each other is they all play an MMO together. So there's one character at least from each book that is in a guild that plays this sort of World of Warcraft type MMO together. It's crazy how fast. Uh, is it uh, Sajik? Is that how you pronounce their last name? Uh, he introduces himself in the U.S. as Stephen Sedgwick, uh, but I think I think it's Sayich. Sayich. He he yeah. always says, "Do a drunk Sean Connery," and that's how you say his name. Stephen <laughs> Sedgwick. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, now it was uh, was it his wife that did the swing book with you? Is that right? Yeah. 
Linda Sedgwick, his wife, does Punder World. She did a book called Wildfire with me. She did Tales of Honor with me. And now, and she did the covers for Postal. So all those covers with yeah. the, the pros, that was her design. Um, and uh, she did Punder World. Um, and yeah, she did the first volume of Swing with me. Volume two through five was done by Yishin Lee, different artist. But she did okay. the first volume. Awesome. It's great. Both of those, both him and his wife are phenomenal artists. I have no idea how... Well, they, maybe they seem fast because they pump out so much material all the time. Uh, I have no fast. idea how <laughs> if they ever sleep. Uh, I'm they gonna are take both fast. Okay, awesome. And to be that good, too, that's not fair. <laughs> I'm going to take a couple of questions for you uh, here. that are here. Any plans for Aphrodite 9 hardcover collection? I enjoyed Aphrodite uh, 9 Rebirth. Well, there is a uh, Aphrodite 9 hardcover collection out, which uh, I, I know there are some copies still available. I've seen them on Amazon for 40 or 50 or $60. I think some of them, it's almost a sold out edition though. So we probably will need to go back to press at some point. I think with that, when we launch, usually when we do new collected editions, it's when we're planning new content for that series or if there's some sort of anniversary like Cyberforce, Switchblade, Darkness, we're planning new series for all these books. It's one of the reasons why we're supporting them with the old content. Did you ever, okay, this is my personal question. Did you ever think standing in that line with your nephew, waiting for Rob Liefeld to sign something, you would be here today? Like, did oh, you ever God. think, like, in comics, working decades in comics? No, it's 20, 29 years, right? 29 yeah. years for me in April. And uh, no, it's weird, man. I, I, I joke with people like, uh, you know, my girlfriend and stuff. I, I don't, I've never filled out a resume. What a wonderful life. Not easy. You know, I've never made one. You know, I mean, I went from uh, college. I was, and then, uh, you know, life held those guys didn't give a fuck about college. I had to finish college on my own uh, mm -hmm. outside of working full time at Extreme. And the fact that I was able to pull that off, uh, I don't know. I, I couldn't, you know, the thing is, I couldn't do that now because uh, I was getting three and four hours of sleep back then trying to do everything. But uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't pull it off these days. I'm too old. You still keep up with Rob? Just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. With who? Rob Liefeld. Rob Liefeld? Yeah, mainly through social media. You know, I was seeing him at three or four cons a year, and we'd sometimes grab a, a, a meal. I would grab a drink. He doesn't drink. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I see him and talk. I talk to him on social media, it seems like, every day in okay. some format. I'll, I'll comment on what he's posting. He comments on what I'm posting. And because there's a lot of 30th anniversary stuff going on, there's a lot of photos and nostalgia yeah. stuff posted. And which is kind of cool because, uh, you know, in one day I got tagged uh, in photos post that McFarlane posted, Jim Lee posted, Wills posted, Mark posted. You know, there's only two or three people that have really been with Image the entire time that weren't founders, you know, and that's me and Eric Stevenson. And I'm sure there's one or two others, but that's uh, not a lot, you know, I mean. Yeah, no, you're right. Everybody kind of, you know, went their own way for a long, you know, for a long time. And it's. It's cool. I mean, and you will always have fans that are like, "Hey, when is that? Uh, what was that image book that they were working on? They were all drawing a piece of it." <laughs> I think, image United. Yeah, Image United. <laughs> People are like, "Where's that? Where's that next issue of Image United, man? When is it coming? When are you getting a hardcover?" I'm sure you all get still like asked those uh, questions. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite book you've worked on, and best experience working with other creators? My favorite book I've ever worked on is Think Tank. Um, I feel like it's my most personal work. Um, it's the stuff I'm most personally interested in. It's also probably of all the books I've done, one of my lower sailing series. And I think that's common where people's passion projects don't do as well as their other books. Like Swing is a book that uh, is right now, it sells more copies than anything else I do. I sold 10 copies of Swing for every copy of the clock I wrote. And uh, that was hard because it took me five years to do the clock and, you know, I wrote the swing in a weekend, you know, so you do these intensive science fiction stories like the clock, which was about the weaponization of cancer, you know, I mean, and it came out right as the pandemic was coming out, which was, a, and my book was about a pandemic. So it was just really weird timing, but the clock was the clock. The clock was a lot of fun. I had a great experience in work with Colleen Doran on that book. She was the artist. She's and, phenomenal. Uh, the, the heart, the, uh, there's no heart, the, Graphic novel trade paperback is out and available now. It's, it's called The Clock. She and I did it together. I really enjoyed it. I think people might not want to particularly read that because it is about a pandemic, but I wrote it years before our COVID experiences. So it's, uh, Have weird. you met, dude, 
the 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 week that the pandemic came out, the Netflix shows, like the the most watched shows, were about like contagion or disaster yeah. things. Anytime there's a disaster, like people watch disaster movies. Just I don't know, human nature, man. We're yeah. a pretty interesting bunch. Uh, if you were to uh, write a character for the big two, which one would it be? You ever thought about that writing for the big two? Uh, I have. Uh, I've talked to them off and on about it. I think I don't know how many working multi-decade writers there are in comics who've never really written for Marvel or DC. Um, I might be the only one. Um, I, I've thought about that the other day, and I'm like, is there anyone else like me that only writes creator own and only has worked for Image in the entire career? And I don't think there is anyone else. I was um, thinking about that because most people that start off independent move on to the big two, learn their lesson, go back to independent. You right. just seem to have stuck with image yeah independent well, top-down image i like creating the stuff and see the thing is again i don't have i'd never had this love for these characters as a kid so i didn't grow up with a fascination and love for the fantastic four you know what i mean or whatever most people have so when i uh, you know when i got into comics you know the first comic books i read were the early image comics and uh to be honest a lot of those weren't really for me you know i mean uh, a lot of more heavy art books the stories were a little light and uh you know so these were books that i personally i when i first got into comics i did not expect to stay in comics because a lot of the books that i was involved in uh i don't feel like they were really done for me it was when rob put me on the maximum press stuff and i started doing battlestar galactica and evangeline and some of the series like those where i really started to discover my interests and and what was possible with the art form you know a book like think tank I don't think it would have done very well in the 80s or 90s, you know, no. but it continues to do well for me now. I mean, like I, I say it doesn't sell phenomenal, but it sells pretty well. You know, I mean, it, it's done well for me. And uh, I, I uh, but if I had to write Marvel or DC, it's weird. I'd write Conan the Barbarian. I mean, yeah, I you, be, yeah, hell yeah, be, man. That'd be my number one choice, you know, or Elric of Melna Bonet. I don't know who owns even those rights, uh, but those are, see, that's I, what I grew up on, you know, you know Cthulhu. <laughs> Stuff like that is what Stephen King is what I grew up reading. I I, I grew up on Arthur C. Clarke, Ray Bradbury, science fiction writers, Isaac Asimov. You know, that's so you, who I you, read. You were a big science fiction reader yes. growing up. So while most of us were geeking out over comics and stuff, you were reading prose novels. Hell yeah, dude, Conan. Yeah. Hell yeah. And if you couldn't get Conan, if you got it at DC, you could bring back well, what's his face, uh, Claw. Yeah, you could bring back Claw. Or hell, we need a new Warlord. God bless. We haven't had a Warlord in. I would write Warlord. I mentioned that to Dan Dio, actually. Did you? Warlord, I told him when he oh, yes. he's gone now, but I talked to Dan at one point because he asked me if I, there were any DC characters I would ever be interested in writing. And, uh, and I talked to him real briefly about Warlord. I think I could write a decent Batman arc, but I, I, the thing is, Batman has been done to death. I mean, there, there's so many Batman stories. And the, the book that Mark Silvestri is doing, I, I've been really enamored with, but it's, it's seeing him, you know, in, cultivate that and work on it over the years and uh and he has kind of a fresh and interesting take on the character i think that's really hard to do i mean you know when you do a think tank book what are you compared to really am i compared to anything i'm compared to myself you know but if you do a batman book you're immediately compared to you know dark knight returns you know you got all these other things you know white knight you i mean long halloween i mean there there's so many insanely good story arcs that uh it, it's harder to uh it's harder to stand out Absolutely. And everybody and their mother will compare you to like their greatest Batman stories. Yeah, this was fine, but it was no Dark Knight. <laughs> like, you right. know, it's just the curse of something like, what's up, Nick? Everyone, in, everyone hit that thumbs up to support Omar. Wow. Also, one of the nicest guys in the industry, Matt Hawkins. Thank you so well, much. Bruce and I worked on, uh, you know, back in the day, we did, before there was a Dynamite Comics, we did uh, Battle of the Planets together. That was a book that Nick had brought to Top Cow. Right before he created Dynamite, and we did, uh, well, we did the, Alex, the Alex Ross covers. The yeah, that was tough, yeah. yeah so Nick and together. big fan of Gachaman. So like when, and I know uh, the American. I, I grew up in Peru, so I was a big fan of that anime. So like here in America, I found out it was called Battle of the Planets, and I was like, oh, cool. It's the same right. stuff I used to watch, but it's in English. So I remember yeah. when that was coming out. It was a time when I had left comics for a while. But when I came back to comics, I saw those Alex Ross covers. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Alex Ross, freaking gotcha, man. I'm in. Yeah. It was, it was fun. And uh, the book was fun. It was, it was a good project, you know. And it was sort of – but uh, I've never been big into licensing, you know. And 
And part of that is because of Battlestar Galactica. I've told the story, if, excuse me, a few times, but when Rob did Battlestar Galactica in 1994, no one cared about Battlestar Galactica. There was no Ron Moore TV show that had come out. Nothing had happened in this combo character since 19, uh, Battlestar Galactica since 1980. No one cared about this book. And I'm not, I don't work with Rob anymore. I'm not here to promote Rob, but Rob single handedly brought Battlestar Galactica back to, to national attention. No one cared about that book. He did these books that he wrote. He wrote with Robert Napton these comics that were about uh, human Cylons and the fleet that had a religion that were hiding out. Does that sound familiar? You know, and uh, later. So, <laughs> no, I mean, there's a book called Battlestar Galactica, The Enemy Within. That's an old book. It's been out of print for a long time, but Rob wrote it. It was done by, uh, I, I was the editor. I remember it very well. And uh, within a year and a half of, of us doing those, and the reason why we did these books is because Rob just loved Battlestar Galactica as a kid. He did it purely for the joy of it. So we did these comics. And then within a year and a half of when this licensing deal expired, uh, Trend Masters had signed on to do a, a line of toys, and they did toys based on our designs in the comic that Carl Alstetter had done. And uh, so we were having toys made on designs that we had done. Uh, and uh, so I, I, in my infinite stupidity, thought that, you know, we were going to go back to Universal to re-up this Battlestar Galactica deal, and they were going to kiss our ass, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's what I thought. And uh, no, what turned out they basically said, uh, oh, Battlestar Galactica is a big thing now, so you're going to have to pay 10 times what you paid for it. And I'm like, wait, what? Oh. And, and uh, I'm like, yeah, it's popular because we did that, you know? And, I, and it's licensing, and I get it, and I understand ownership and IP ownership and all stuff. But at a tender age of 23, 24, whenever that was, after all that work, to just be treated like no one gave a shit about what we did and that we didn't give any contribution. When I saw that what we did created this swell of wave, which led to the new TV show. There's no question in my mind that happened. And uh, I'm not trying to take any personal credit for that at all. Cause I didn't have anything to do with creatively. I was just tired as the editor. And, uh, but it is fascinating to me. So that's a long winded story explaining to you why I personally dislike licensing because uh, in a situation. You can't write Conan. We better stick with Warlord, <laughs> just in case. Well, but Conan, you know, see, Conan's a little different because I, you know, and also Conan to me is a property that's never gone out of favor. You know, I mean, there've always been Conan right. books, and and you know, so I I would write that book and add something to the canon. I would do it gladly. Um, I, I used to at one point want I I wanted to add something to the Star Wars mythology, but I don't want to do that anymore. They've they've ruined it too much for me over the years. <laughs> What do you mean they? You mean Lucas, or you mean the canon Star Wars that is that have gone all of the above? All well, the look, above. the uh, I tell you, there, there's never been a more you know, and I know I, I I don't know if it's controversial. I try not to be negative, but the uh, episode one was in my lifetime the single biggest disappointing thing ever, and I've been divorced twice, dude. So I'm telling you that my watching of episode one was more <laughs> disappointing than either one of my divorces. <laughs> I think I was blinded. I assume you went to see it opening night. You stood in line like everybody else did. Uh, I, I think I was blinded by Darth Maul so much that I was like, okay, I think there's a good movie in here. I went to see it again. Um, and while I, I don't think that one that one bothered me as much, I think, I think episode two is the one that kind of did me in a little bit. I was oh, like, the oh, chemistry oh. between those two was ungodly bad. You know, I mean, it's like how to shoot a romance and, and make it not work. Here, here, use this as an example. You know? But I also, I, I also realized that for a lot of people, especially, you know, now in their 20s and 30s, like that was their Star Wars growing up. Just like my right. dad took me to go see uh, Return of the Jedi. That was their experience with their fathers or, or yeah. mothers or, you know, or their older brothers. Like that to them is their Star Wars. So I, I. I'm like you. I don't like to talk about anything negative, but I have strong feelings about some certain Star Wars movies. Yes. Well, and, you know, May 25th, 1977, I saw Star Wars in theater, you know, uh, yeah, on the opening day in 1977 in Wichita, Kansas. I remember seeing it with my sister and my grandmother, and we were the only three people in the theater. You know, I, I, it fascinates me because people seem to think that Star Wars was a runaway success. Star Wars was in the theater for over a year. I mean, that, means, that might seem weird to people now, but movies like Indiana Jones and when, in the 80s, in the early 80s and late 70s, these movies were in theaters for years sometimes, you know? And, and that, the reason why they were so popular is because people kept going to see them. 
There was no streaming. There was no movie channel or HBO back then. So if you wanted to see Star Wars again, you had to go watch it at the theater. You know, and my sister and I went and saw Star Wars, I think, every weekend for six months. You know, and within a few weeks, the theater was packed. See, that's the thing is, like, I went in the same theater two weeks apart. And the first day, May, I remember, I'll never forget this, May 25th, 1977, it was the three of us, my sister, me, and my grandmother. We were the only three in the fucking theater. Flash forward seven days, it was packed. Word of mouth. Absolutely. And I, the only time I've ever experienced anything like that in the theater was with uh, The Matrix. I went to see The Matrix opening night in a crappy, like, it was... It was six screens, and I was in the crappiest screen because that's the only thing they gave it. The following week when I was taking my friends to go see it, it was in three of the big screens and sold out in yeah. word of mouth. Like before, you know, and I, I realized the internet was around then. Definitely not when Star Wars came out, but the, the internet had a lot to do with that. Like people were talking about it in forums and things like that. Uh, what was that, 1999, right? The Matrix. Yeah, it was crazy. I had never seen anything like that. I was like, oh, this movie everybody else must be talking about it. I wasn't the only one that thought this was good. Well, see, my sons are both Generation Z or whatever it is. They're 21 and 19. And uh, to them, their Star Wars is uh, one of them said Lord of the Rings. The other one said uh, Harry Potter. Those are the movies that they grew up with that had the same <laughs> yeah. impact that, that Star Wars had to me. You know, my older son said Lord of the Rings and my younger son said Harry Potter. And I looked at when those movies came out and how old they were. And it's not coincidental that they were between the age of 8 and 12 when those movies came out. And I'm like, oh, I was eight when Star Wars came out. I was 11 when Empire Strikes came back out. And I was 14 when Return of the Jedi came out. And I remember slightly disliking Return of the Jedi. And uh, and from that point, you know, but those other films were so amazing. And I, I got really involved in the, in the canon. Like I read all the Timothy Zahn books. And, uh, you know, I remember reading Splinter of the Mind's Eye, which had uh, what uh, Luke and Leia making out in it because they weren't brother and sister at that point. No, they weren't. Well, I mean, yeah. no, they were always brothers and sister. They just didn't know about it. Oh, no, uh, that was that was that was, that was retconned then, or they would never have allowed that book. I love called. that you say that about Luke. Is like it was retconned. In. I love it. That's great. Um, yeah, that, that brings back a lot of memories, like going to see those movies and then hoping for more. It's crazy now. Like the people, like the the kids, have no idea how good they have it. Oh my god, I sound like an old man, but how good they have it if they go see a Star Wars movie in the theater and then. I'll just go to Disney Plus and watch, uh, you know, the further adventures of all these characters I'm watching on right. the screen. We had uh, yeah. toys, our imagination, the Marvel comics that were coming out, and yeah. that was about it. And then the crappy, <laughs> was it? The, uh, Ewoks was okay. It was the uh, the droids cartoon. I could never get into the droids wow. cartoon. But yeah. Battle for Andor still kicks ass. Battle for Andor is still one of my favorites. I love that. Right. Um, everyone, go thank you, Nick, for the kind super chat. Everyone, check out Top Cow's website. Support all their books, Cyberforce, Think Tank, Witchblade, and so much more. Hit that like button for Omar. He always has the best interviews. You, Nick. you great content. Nick's Thank you so much. Oldest, Nick's one of my oldest friends in the industry. Uh, we've known each other since 93. He's one of the first guys I met. So, Oh, wow. Good guy. He, he's a big fan of comics, man. All right. We'll take a couple more questions, and then I do not want – this guy is busy writing stuff. So what's your favorite genre? Uh, definitely science fiction. I mean, I, I, I've always loved science fiction. Like I said, I grew up on Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, fantasy to a lesser extent. Uh, superheroes are not my thing at all. Um, I like horror, but not a lot. You know, I, 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 I appreciate everything for what it is. I used to hate romance and, and, uh, but now that I write the shit, I have to, you know, and, and, <laughs> inoculate myself or inculcate myself with the stuff so i've watched a lot of rom-coms and a lot of uh and, and read a lot of romance literature and, and I've, I've sort of gone through it and discovered what i think is better and worse and uh there's some really good stuff out. I, you know I, I it is weird for me now to be referred to as a romance writer when i've written probably 500 science fiction comics and graphic novels and six romance graphic novels you know i mean it's on your resume it's on your resume now man yeah, I've never written. written. <laughs> Some of the best and unique books in my collection have been from Top Cow and Image. Very the cool. Green, they, they put out some great stuff. Hearing how you were a big reader before comics, have you ever thought about writing your own book one day? I wrote a think tank, a think tank, a think tank novel uh, three years ago. I sat down, I wrote the whole thing in six months, did about uh, five, six pages a day, and I uh, got to the end of it and hated it. 
So um, I never felt that way about comics I wrote. I, I think novels, prose is probably the only pure art form for writers, you know? I mean, and maybe that scares me because I'm a little more collaborative because uh, if you write a novel, it's pretty much just you. But if you write a comic, it's a collaboration between me and an artist and an editor, you know? Yeah, and, uh, okay. Yeah, TV is a collaboration between people. And often I find that I work well collaborating, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, and writing prose is just a different skill set. My sister does that, and she does a good job at it. But uh, I would like to – you know, the thing is – the truth is I would love to. I've tried. I, I should probably try again. If I found uh, someone that was an actual book editor that would help me with it and I could pay – I mean, I'm not even talking about for free. Um, I, I would like to give it a stab because I think there are a lot of people that read prose that don't read comics and graphic novels, and I think that, that there's, you know – Maybe the possibility of crossing over. Because I, I see people that read Neil Gaiman's novels that eventually find some of his comics. Right. And I'd like to do the same thing. Because it, it it pisses me off when people sort of denigrate comics as kitty fluff and, and crap. Because yeah. there's some good stuff. We uh, I always mention that on the channel. Like uh, It's gotten better. I will say that. It's gotten a lot better. Uh, mainly because of the movies and the, and the TV shows and stuff. Um, but, you know, I remember traveling to Japan and people in business suits like reading manga on the train. Yeah, on the and, yeah. And I remember thinking, God, what the only other time I will say that I've ever experienced anything like that is when a new freaking Harry Potter book came out. And I'm not a big I wasn't a Harry Potter fan at all. Uh and no offense to anybody that is. I, I think it's wonderful that you're reading. But I was jealous. I was like, oh man, it'd be great if people were reading comics at buses, like bus stops, as much as I'm seeing these books. But yeah. In America, I think we've had the mentality for a long time. This stuff is for children. This stuff is for kids. And like I said, it's gotten a lot better. A lot yeah. better. Um, you know, you you see people, kids represent with their hell, man. You see people in Cyber Force shirts, man. That's cool. Like, yeah, thanks you for well, cool. right. You look at my fan groups. The two people, the groups, the, based on demographic research I have, the science fiction readers that I have are men, uh, thirty five plus. That's who's reading Think Tank, Postal, and those. <laughs> yeah, way to go, was. Yeah. So if you're looking at uh, like Sunstone and Swing, that's about 60, 40 female to male. And, and the bulk of it is middle age. It's Again, it's 30 plus. So you're looking at middle aged women are the bulk readers of these other books that I'm doing, uh, which, which is strange because I, I grew up in, in sort of the image world where, you know, in 1993 and 94, you went to a convention and it was almost all guys you know i mean there were very few girls at these things at all and uh and they were typically younger you know and i and the thing is i don't know for better or for worse i think it's probably for worse is we have a lot of the same fans 30 years later and i, I think that's good for nostalgia but there's there's not a lot of the uh lower end like uh there just doesn't seem to be as big of a, a readership for for you know in the in like the 16 to 29 range for comics and I, and I realize that that is a completely different topic, and I would love to talk to you about that sometime, especially coming from a perspective of somebody that, you know, you guys are doing Kickstarter and things like that for your own books. Uh, but, you know, uh, to me, it's all about, like, I love collected editions because this is the stuff I'm going to leave my kids. I, I want my daughters both read comics because I and I realize perhaps I could have had a kid that may have played, I don't know tennis or gone to the ballet instead of reading comics but both my wife and i are comic readers and yeah. we were hoping right like hey let's introduce the kids at an early age to a lot of these characters we did not force it on them and they still have every right to stop reading if they want to but they genuinely have fun reading comics and i think it's it's all about that it's like it's finding that price point for kids to get into now that and like i said this is a completely different topic and i don't want to uh, i'm gonna take a couple more questions but you know like um Manga seems to have a big following here in America uh, because of that price point and pretty much the, the type of stories that young kids gravitate towards. And yeah. I think Image and Dark Horse and, um, you know, the smaller independent comics like uh, Mad Cave Studios and places like that, they have found, you know, those type of stories. You guys have been doing it for a long time. It's not just superhero stuff. You know, I think right. most of the time now, nowadays, when people think of image, they don't think superheroes hardly anymore. No. They probably think of things, maybe superhero, maybe like Invincible or something like that. But for right. the most part, they probably think like Walking Dead or stories like oh. that that are uh, 
less superhero and more sci-fi and more down-to-earth kind of stories. Well, by the way, the uh, the company that is correctly doing children's comics is Line Webtoon. And I know that's not a publisher, but it's an aggregator, a distributor. It's a web comics portal. And uh, it is where young boys and girls are reading comics. And the correct price point for those, they're free. Free, yeah. You know, I mean, people go on their phones or on their iPad and they read these comics and they have them age gated. So you can go in and if you're a parent, you can you can make sure they're not reading Sunstone. Um, and there's just a lot of content on there. I mean, if you look at Punderworld, Punderworld is a book that Linda Sedgwick writes and draws. And uh, it is a top cow book. We published the first volume. Uh, it is the number two book on Mind Webtoon. She's had like 80 million views or something like that. I mean, the numbers are ungodly compared to the print numbers we get. I mean, so you're looking yeah. at some of these top books like Laura Olympus and, and Punderworld. They're getting millions and millions of views. Uh, and then you're looking at what a top selling graphic novel of 30, 40,000 copies. Yeah, exactly. Which is, yeah, it's just one of those things too. I think they are, it, it, that is also getting better, right? Like the sales of graphic novels are gradually getting better. Um, well, and- that's not really true. I mean, that is true as an aggregate because there are more being published than ever. And the ones that are doing well are doing well. But the average graphic novel does not sell very well because there are so many that are done. I mean, the thing is, is you're only seeing the ones that you want to see. You know, there's probably, what is it, like 2,000 books, various SKUs a week that come out. And I, how many of those even get to the uh, shelves? Well, if you're talking about bookstores or, or are you talking about like comic book stores? I'm talking about comic stores. There's what, 30 or 40,000 SKUs in every issue of previews? I mean, yeah, there's but, so much content that is available. That, but that goes, uh, that goes back to the – unfortunately, it goes back to the a type of discount that comic book stores get on these big books, right? It's different than ordering 30 copies of a single issue. If you get two copies of a hardcover that are $50, your discount is going to vary. And then on top of that, how – because of places like Amazon or even retailer online retailers – you know, you really got to love your comic book store to go in there and support it to buy a $50 book because you could yeah. find it easily on Amazon for yeah. $30, $27. Again, a different topic. Uh, and I realize we're running out of time, but th- this guy's been asking for a little bit here. I heard Matt saying on a live stream a few months back talking about Ballistic, the miniseries, I assume. Cyber Force Om- uh, is in this Cyber Force Omni. What does he mean? The actual micro- Michael Turner mini b- Ballistic? Yeah. So that's and Michael Turner's cool. first first work was a ballistic miniseries. I remember on Cyber. That. Yeah. that was the very first work he ever did. And yeah, I think the first issue or two of that is in the first hardcover. Uh, and then the because it splits the, the story split the time the two arcs. Um, so I think yeah, Mike Turner's first work is in this Cyber Force hardcover. <laughs> All right, those fans thirty years later is keeping the industry afloat. In a way. No, it is. No, no, no. Please. I am not denigrating these people. Thank you. We love you. Thank you so much. We, we, we appreciate our chops. Um, but uh, no, I, I what I'm saying is, is the fans 30 years later are definitely keeping us all employed. There's no question about that. My fear is the next generation of these people that are reading. I, I'm curious, what, is, what does it mean for comic retail? I mean, there's always going to be a uh, desire for this stuff. The fact that the web comics is free. Mm-hmm. Substack and some of these other things that are going on. Uh, Patreon, you know, the Cedrics have a Patreon, uh, mm-hmm. and it's where they're getting probably half of their readership that reads their shit on their Patreon. You know, so it's a great time to be an A-list creator right now. I love that you said A-list <laughs> because you're right. A lot of people try to do that same approach, and unfortunately, can't make ends meet. Right. Uh, my daughter's 11 we, uh, is all in with the YA graphic novels, Babysitter's Club. Yeah, I remember my kids reading that. I'm like, put that up and read some X-Men. My niece is also 11 and it's with anime. Neither are into traditional comics, which says a lot. I can always hope. You can always hope. And it's all about, to me, it's about that right introductory age. Like, and you can't, and you can't, kids are going to do whatever they're gonna, they want to do. You can't right. force kids into reading whatever you want to. Uh, or enjoying the same things you want to. I'm sure Matt, as a father, has been heartbroken many times when he took his young sons and like, oh, we're going to watch one of my favorite movies as a kid. They're like, dang, this movie sucks, Dad. <laughs> and it's a heartbreaking. 
Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I tried to show them they live. They didn't appreciate it like I did. Oh, what a freaking awesome movie, man. As someone who had his own comic book hit comic shops, it was sad when I went to my local comic sh uh, shop to buy it. They didn't even order any copies from Diamond. That's that's pretty common. I I, I think it happens a lot more than you, than you think. I mean, uh, you know, if it's your local comic book store and you tell them that it's your comic, they'll probably carry it. Or you can go have them, you can go right. hand them some and ask them to sell it on consignment, which is what a lot of people will do. They'll go to a store and give them five copies of store credit, or they'll say, hey, will you sell these? And if you sell these in a month, Will you pay me? And if not, I'll take the books back. There's a lot of ways to do that. And all these stores are, you know, independent owner operators. So they can do whatever, whatever they want. But uh, yeah. It is. It is. It's difficult, I think, and heartbreaking. But you're right. I think that does happen a lot. They Live is superb. Thank you, Tolga. Thank you. And that is, uh, I use They Live, and, and I've used that as a reference to so many things. Because even when we, when I first came to Top Cow and I looked at Witchblade, I'm like, you know, the Witchblade is kind of like the They Live sunglasses. You know, when she puts the gauntlet on, she sees the supernatural world that's always yeah. around us that no one else can see. And uh, so I started using that as a, a reference point for that, and uh, it works well. Um, okay. Matt, I want to thank you so much for being here uh, with me today, for going well over the hour we had planned. I really appreciate you taking all the all these questions and answering them. I like I like the honesty, man. That's nice. I like the honesty. That's good. It's a good thing to have. Uh, you have a huge fan here. Love Postal. And Thanks, Dan. Jeff loves Think Tank. I as well. I think Think Thanks, Tank is probably my favorite. My favorite I don't know. What's your, it, like, what do you see most people enjoy out of your work? Like, wait, meeting you at conventions. Like, what, what is the book uh, that they're like, man, this is – amazing uh it depends on the person and i can almost identify them if it's a woman it's almost always swing you know she's come up to me i love the swing oh, book. Plain, yeah. right uh, very rarely do women come up to me and say hey i love your postal book but it happens it does happen but uh and usually it's interesting because the, the people that come up especially the women that come up and read postal and think tank they're almost offended when i try to sell them swing so i don't even bother anymore <laughs> they, uh, they seem offended to be lumped in with the rest of the women hey whatever <laughs> everyone's into their own thing you know, but uh, Think Tank is probably my favorite work, my most personal work. Uh, it. it's, the, it's the book that put me on the map. You know, Postal is probably the one that I get the most uh, comments on. Um, and looking forward to that Cyber Force hardcover collection, as am I. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the live stream. Thank you again to Matt. Thank you to Lisa from Top Cow for putting it together. I'd love to have you back, maybe you and Mark back whenever you're yeah. wanting to do the next Cyber Force. Uh, Kickstarter. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe out there. Awesome. Thank you so much.